so today's um, schedule is slightly different in the sense that the, the um, you know the so the class will um, just go to for a little over an hour and then um, then we'll take just a five minute break and then well I'm not actually I'm not usually I lead a meditation at the beginning of class but I'm I'm not going to do that because we're going to do the um, Gandan Legema the hundred deities uh, of the land of Gandan or Tushida uh, after the five minute break in honor of um, Lama Zobar Bashe. And we're going to do that in accordance with the, we're going to meditate on the that guru yoga practice in accordance with the text we're studying. So we're going to use some points from the text we're studying to sort of reflect on and meditate on, again, Legema. So, because actually the text we're studying is a good text to use for guru yoga, um, especially the section we're up to, actually, is, and so on. So, um, so we'll do the meditation. This, usually we do the meditation in nine class you know, or something like that, but we can reverse it. So we can just briefly bring to mind our motivation, though. And so that the motivation for studying this this kind of uh, this text is um, love and compassion and bodhicitta. Right? So we're studying Buddha nature. And so the ultimate motivation of studying Buddha nature or reason for studying it is to achieve Buddhahood, right, which we have already have the potential for. But it's actually it's compassion that, you know, it's like you say in the text, right? Like water that softens and allows things to grow. So it's compassion that allows our Buddha nature to kind of soften and develop. <clears throat> so compassion that includes all sentient beings, including ourselves and all others. And with that and with that kind of um, the bodhicitta, uh, I should say the one time, I'll just do it once, the verse of refuge in bodhicitta. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Well, let's just be brief. Uh, today's the um, part of the reason we're doing it after in a few minutes, in a little in an hour or so, we'll do the <clears throat> Gendan Legema or 100 Days of Tushita Pure, Pure Land, because today's the one year anniversary of the passing of. Um, Lama Zopran Pshkabje, Lama Zopran Pshkabje, who was the, uh, who was the uh, spiritual director of the whole organization that this center is part of, and was my own teacher. Um, so I wanted to um, also uh, uh, dedicate this class to, to Lama Zopran Pshkabje. Or is the microphone on? Is it not? Yeah. Is it close enough? Maybe it needs to be. Yeah. Well, then it's bad with this. <laughs> Or to arrange all of them. Is that okay? Is it working now? It's running a little more towards my body. Let's see. There. Computer will fall if I take any further. Is that kind of okay? Folks online? Can you hear, Jay? Can everybody hear? Yeah, maybe yeah. the volume can be Oh, yeah, it's probably the volume. It's expected we didn't have that. Okay, so we're studying, um, we're on the section of the text that covers Buddha nature. It's a little bit too loud, just slightly. Um, feedback, can't tell. Um, and so we're, uh, we're up to the ninth of 10 points that sort of are Maitreya, right? It's, I'm sure this is a statue of my children who wrote this text. Uh, so we're up to the ninth of 10 points that are kind of elucidating or explaining about Buddha nature. After this, actually, we're almost at the end of the section of the 10 points. And then uh, and after those 10 points explaining Buddha nature, there come these very, um, very well-known sort of um, similes for Buddha nature, which are quite beautiful. We won't get to those today. But that's the next section of the text. Um, and so that what we've been covering most recently at this point is discussing how uh, there are like three phases ascension a person a, a being goes through, right? And I said this last time a little bit, but there there are like 
you know, there are a lot of ways that different different cultures and traditions and that people that uh, what's the word that beings can be categorized or described. Here, this text is describing beings as um, uh, the term they use is uh, impure, then pure and impure, and then pure. And what that's getting at is um, impure just means still having mental afflictions, right? Uh, that we still have all our, we still get angry and crave things and are prideful and jealous and are ignorant and so on. So that's the, so the impure isn't describing somebody else, it's describing oneself. Uh, then partially pure and partially impure are those who have seen uh, the ultimate truth directly in meditative equipoise and therefore have eliminated some of the mental afflictions. So they're, they've started the process of eliminating, but they aren't fully, they still have mental afflictions, but they're not, or, or, or the imprints of mental afflictions also, they can still have. Um, and then they're totally pure are the Buddhas, the fully enlightened beings. And the one I told I, this last time when they said partly pure and partly impure, one way of describing that is the commentary says compared to people who have more mental afflictions, they're partly pure compared to Buddhas, they're partly impure. So it's relative. It's you know, and the point being, of course, that's a reminder of emptiness, isn't it? Everything exists relative to something else. Uh, things do exist, but how they exist is relatively in, in relative relationship. Uh, okay, so we're up to the ninth point, and we started that one last time, and we've been going through this description in the text of the partially pure and partially impure, uh, how one sort of progresses. So the text is sort of describing how, and part of the point the text is making is through all those phases, right? So from being, um, you know, how, so from so if you're, you know, if we start with somebody who's like completely overwhelmed with anger or hatred or addiction or something. All the way up to a fully enlightened Buddha, of course, um, the text is saying something about that, which is, on the one hand, of course, they change, right? It's a process. On the other hand, there's an aspect in which, let's say it this way, the Buddha nature of that being is unchanged, right? And um, so that even when you're totally covered, you know, overwhelmed with uh, your own afflictive emotions, for example, there's something in you that says that's unstained, that's never been um, impure. So, you know, when we say impure, but one's Buddha nature is primordially pure. So it's getting at a kind of point there that's useful in terms of our own practice to recognize, even when we have our mental afflictions, the ultimate nature of our mind is uh, pure from the beginning. It's a pure in the middle and pure at the end. <laughs> that's pure all along. But conventionally, of course, there's a difference, you know, and it makes a difference, doesn't it, from a practical perspective. If you have a hatred or don't have hatred, it makes it quite a big difference. But that doesn't, but the reason that the hatred can be eliminated is because the ultimate nature of mind was pure all along. Um, so in the verse we just left off with last time, it says, um, this is describing bodhisattvas like the Bodhisattvas progressed through 10 grounds or bhumis in Sanskrit. And so we're up to the section that's describing Bodhisattvas on the eighth to the 10th bhumis. Yeah. This might be too elementary of a question, but it's just all kind of simple thing on my mind. When you talk about like the pure, the new nature that we all have, um, is that even so with like severe? mental illnesses where people don't have any control over things but they and they really do evil things and i mean is that true there too yeah yeah that's yeah so the buddhist view you know there's a um you know the buddhist stance really is that all sentient beings have buddha nature and so there's the you know the um there's a famous story uh of angulimala you know that story it's a famous story of the time of the buddha where um so, uh, actually, his name even uh, Anguli means, in, I guess, uh, it was in Sanskrit or Pali. Is that finger. Finger? Yeah, finger. But I don't know if it's Pali or Sanskrit. Isn't it? I think it's Pali think Sanskrit Sanskrit. Sanskrit. or Sanskrit. But uh, anyway, Anguli Mala means finger rosary, like ra Mala, like a like this. You know, like, but he had a. He was wearing a. He was an evil person who was a serial killer, and he had this idea that if he killed a hundred people. 100 or 108, I can't remember which, 
that he would then that that was the way to, for him to be happy. And so he had he had I think it was a hundred. So I think he had killed ninety nine people and he kept their fingers. Like a horrible, you know, so horrible person. And then um, he just he chose this last victim was gonna and he chose the Buddha. And um, and so the story goes that he was walking to try to catch the Buddha to kill him. But the Buddha kept walk, kept going just a slightly fat, like the exact same pace, so he couldn't gain on him. But he could, he was, but he was like he would walk faster, and the Buddha would walk exactly that much faster. And then he would go a little faster, and the, and um, and he could never catch the Buddha. So he's like following. And Buddha was always walking everywhere. Of course, that was how the Buddha lived. So um, finally, Angulimala became en enraged because he was a rageful person, and he screamed. Like, Stop! And the Buddha turned around and said something like, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's something like, actually, it's time for you to stop. Uh, and somehow, because it was the Buddha, and because of the interaction, Angulimala was able to understand that what the Buddha meant, that he didn't just mean stop chasing me. He meant stop killing, but he also meant stop the underlying ignorance and hatred that make you want to kill. And Angulimala stopped, and he kind of thought about what the Buddha had said, and then he said, I want to become your disciple, because I'm miserable, essentially. And um, and they say that in that very lifetime, Angulimala became an arhat. So he gained meditative equipoise, understood nature of reality, and, and got rid of his mental afflictions. And that story is often used in, I mean, he's one of the disciples of the Buddha, a direct disciple, who was famous at the time, but um, or as famous in Buddhist scriptures, at least, but uh, that story is often used to make this point that um, even the worst people uh, have the potential for enlightenment. And in the Tibetan tradition, there's a famous example of Milarepa, right, who killed quite a few people uh, in vengeance for sort of the way he, his family was treated by his aunt and uncle, and then he did black magic and killed people. And he's like angry. But I, I mean, like the deranged. Angulimala would be a better example of that. Yeah. Exactly. No, so Angulimala is used often as an example to make this point that even the most horrible beings. We're like incapable almost of, I mean, you know, people don't want to be that way on purpose. <laughs> no. Yeah. And so the idea is that, is that, uh, yeah, even the worst people have good in nature. Cool. Yeah. Good question, I think. Um, okay, uh, so and then the, the text is describing bodhisattvas uh, that were up to this point where so between the eighth and the tenth bumi or ground, that's the level on which the bodhisattva has eliminated all their mental afflictions, but it's not yet a Buddha. So they still have these um they don't yet they no longer have mental afflictions themselves, but they have the subtle imprints of them that cause dualistic, that cause them to experience things dualistically. So they haven't gotten rid of it. It's like, um, and I, I've used this metaphor before, it's a traditional one, Buddhism. Uh, it's like, the analogy they give to these imprints is like, if you had a container of garlic and you eliminate all the garlic from it, it still smells like garlic. Um, and it could take quite a while to get rid of the smell. And so that's a metaphor here. These bodhisattvas are like that. They've gotten rid of the mental afflictions, but they still have the leftover uh, subtle effects of that. Um, and so it says of those kind of bodhisattvas, they know, uh, this is on page 13 for those who are following, but it says they know precisely by whatever appearance and with which method each student needs to be tamed, whether by teaching, by displaying a form body, by conduct or by deeds. And so that means, um, you know, teaching means like giving formal teachings, like explaining the Dharma. Um, and then uh, Displaying a form body means that they manifest bodies. They actually uh, sort of you know, take rebirth, manifest bodies to benefit others. No, that's the reason for taking rebirth. Uh, then conduct is like um, not formal teaching, but through their demeanor. They, they you know, they're, that their very way of being present. I explained a little about this last time, so I won't go into detail, but uh, their way of being present interpersonally without even formally teaching is a teaching. Um, and then deeds means even by their coming and going, right? So just by their appearing uh, somewhere, they kind of can. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, 
She didn't know she was giving that. She was reading a story by a hundred and something year old woman who had met Gandhi once through her window. She hadn't talked to him. She'd just seen him through her window. And she said it changed her life. She was a girl in India. She saw Gandhi through the window and she said, oh, it changed her life. And she went on to do all these. And many people describe that experience with the Dalai Lama, right? right? Just seeing him sort of does something for them. So that's what they mean by that kind of, that enlightened beings have that capacity to, just by their presence, affect. And then it says, in this way, for living beings filling the limits of space, the intelligent ones uh, always work perfectly and acting spontaneously and without obstruction, the welfare of sentient beings. Um, so it means they have limitless sort of skillful methods for helping others. Um, and it says, and, and uh, another point they're making here is without uh, but it, where it says um, spontaneously and without obstruction, it means that they, um, the commentary makes a point, which we're going to get to later, which is Buddhas are completely without effort. Uh, they, their, their activities are completely effortless. And then it says these kinds of beings um, who are on the eighth to tenth boomies, because they still see things dualistically, it takes a subtle little bit of effort. <laughs> point. It's not completely effortless, but it's, compared to us, it's like it's effortless. Um, uh, I'm not going to go too far astray here, but I'll just make one quick comment. Like, I would make this because maybe you remember it just um, since uh, Lama Zobrish has been on my mind a lot. And one day I was talking with Lama Zobrish. I was supposed to be <laughs> total failure, actually, my part. I was supposed to be writing a book with Rinpoche. So I was doing these interviews, but I couldn't do it. Uh, and so one of my failed efforts was I, I thought, oh, I was trying to write it for like ordinary people, you know. So I said to him, like Lama Zobrish was famous for not sleeping, that he would go days, weeks, like oh, more than a week sometimes without sleeping. And uh, so I said to Rinpoche, I said, how do you deal with it when you get tired? Like how, do, how you know, people, people have that experience. I thought it might help to know how you cope with fatigue. Like how do you deal with it when you get tired? He was in his 60s at that point. And he said to me, um, he said, very sorry, but uh, I can't answer that question because I haven't had that experience yet. <laughs> uh, and I said, what? <laughs> and Rinpoche said, I haven't gotten tired yet. Uh, ask me again when I'm older and maybe if I have that experience, I'll do my best to answer. But because I haven't had the experience yet, I can't, I can't answer your question, sorry. Uh, so I, said, I kind of sat there <laughs> I think I thought of, um, so effortless, right? I mean, there's getting at the activity of enlightened beings are effortless, right? Um, like that. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to, you'll appreciate this. That I, I said, I think in that same interview, I was, I was trying to, it was supposed to be on self-esteem. So I said to Rinpoche, um, <laughs> I said, I said, uh, people think in the Western psychology sometimes we think that people get, part of help, what helps self-esteem is having role models. Who is your role model as a child? And um, I thought he would say Hillary Brown or something great. Okay, he said, Snowball Man. <laughs> and I said, again, what? This is why my interviews weren't working. And then I said, what's well, Snowball Man? And he said, he started describing, and I realized he meant the Yeti, you know, uh, oh. that his uncle had seen the Yeti in Nepal. He grew up in Nepal. That his uncle had seen the Yeti. He hadn't seen him, but he wanted to see the Yeti as a young boy. So he said, Snowball Man. <laughs> so, uh, this book's not working. <laughs> um, Anyway, never got really. Um, uh, then the next verse is getting. So then, then there's um, those are the eighth to the eighth through the beginning of the tenth boomi, and then there's actual tenth boomi bodhisattvas and their final rebirth, and that's my tray about it. So like when when Shakyamuni Buddha was in. Actually, this is important for the prayer we're going to do. Shakyamuni Buddha, right, was in um, Ganden or Tushita, her paradise. That's the that's for when, when a Buddha is going to come to this planet. They first take rebirth as a final lifetime bodhisattva in, in Sanskrit is called Tushita Paradise um, and uh, the land of joy. And um, that's why they call it the 100 deities of the land of joy. It's the English translation of Tushita, which Ganden, by the way, Ganden is, uh, you know, sometimes they call our, the Glukpa tradition, the Ganden tradition, because Lama Tsongkhapa named his monastery Ganden after Tushita. It's the Tibetan word for Tushita Paradise. And so, um, when Shakyamuni Buddha was going to uh, leave Tushita Paradise, uh, Maitreya took rebirth there and became the, his final lifetime in 
Tushita. And so he's the next Buddha to come to this planet. Uh, so they say he lives in Tushita paradise. He sort of is the leader of teaching Dharma there. And uh, and then, um, you know, there'll come a time when he comes here and then the next Buddha will become the uh, leader of Tushita. So it's describing bodhisattvas at that point. So it says, uh, so it's describing those bodhisattvas uh, in their last lifetime, it says, last lifetime bodhisattva. So it says, this mode of the bodhisattvas in post-meditation sessions is renowned in the world as being equal to the Tagadas by way of perfectly liberating sentient beings. Um, I just found this funny, so I'll share it. In the commentary, it said, it said um, where it says, they're renowned as equal in the world as being... Uh, renowned in the world as being equal to the Tagadas by way of perfectly liberating sentient beings. It says these bodhisattvas are so skillful and effective in their compassion that they can benefit an equal number of sentient beings. And it says, but then the next verse, but they're not the same as the Buddhas yet. And then the next verse explains that. It says, it is true to say that the difference between the earth and a speck of dust and between a great ocean of the water and the hoof print of an ox is the difference between a Buddha and a Bodhisattva. So it's saying, even though they can benefit the same number of beings, when you compare, right, like the little speck of dust versus the entire earth or a hoof print of an ox versus an ocean. Um, and then in the commentary, it says, so what's the difference? You know, how they're, they're different. And then it says, um, there are numerous ways, of course, but a big one is uh, even a bod Bodhisattva on the final lifetime um because uh, until they're a buddha they can't simultaneously see the ultimate nature of reality directly and work for sentient beings they have to go back and forth right so they can enter meditative equipoise seeing the ultimate nature of reality but when they want to benefit beings they can't see that ultimate nature uh but a buddha can do both simultaneously and therefore a buddha is, and so not that's one way of saying it another way of saying it is those beings still have some dualistic experience whereas the buddha's experience is completely monotonistic. another way of saying it is um yeah buddhas know everything directly whereas these bodhisattvas don't and another point is that these bodhisattvas are not yet omniscient those buddhas are omniscient so buddhas know all knowable things those bodhisattvas don't so there are various ways in which uh, even final lifetime bodhisattva is not the same as the buddha but then they're making the point, but in terms of actually benefiting be beings, they're very effective and they can benefit the same number of beings. So the benefit of such beings don't look the same? It says the same number. And that actually, Gyal J makes an interesting commentary. He says, some people in their comment, Gyal J in his, um, in this comment, you know, his, uh, his commentary says, some people, because he gets at that question that you just raised, Gyal J, and he says, uh, some people in the past tried to comment on this verse by saying, well, you know, um, is the difference somehow that, uh, you know, they say that like uh, there's a difference between benefiting ordinary beings and benefiting other bodhisattvas. And they say, so they said some people thought, oh, like a Buddha is better, better at benefiting ordinary beings or than a tenpumi bodhisattva. That they don't know how to do it as much as the Buddha. And then uh, he says, that's not correct. They can benefit ordinary beings, the tenpumi bodhisattvas. So he really says there isn't a difference in that way. The difference is in their own experience, I guess. So the benefit is the same. That's what it seems like Gelsum J is saying. Yeah. At least that was how I read Gelsum J's commentary, but it was the same. So um, when we, I mean, you know, I work with a bunch of Christians and stuff, and it makes me think about, like, I've always thought Jesus was a Bodhisattva, I just always thought that. But it makes me think about, the, and you said, mentioned the duality in his thinking, and then there's like, like before he got crucified, he spent some days in a garden suffering and it looked like like um like the Buddha was sort of, but um he uh didn't sit like the Buddha did. He he cried out in despair, and which is kind of like I wouldn't think a Buddha would do that, but uh, I would to see a, a Bodhisattva having that dual uh you know awareness of of who he was. What's was frightened in vain. Is that kind of like the duality you're talking about? Personally, comes I can't use the experience with yeah, yeah. But um, I guess I'll differentiate a couple of different things. One is well, it's very clear, and there was in the in the teaching at least, and how they explain it, you know, is that uh, and how my tray is explaining here is 
Yeah, a Buddha, uh, a Buddha is complete. Yeah, has a completely non-dualistic. Completely, I mean, it says in the and earlier in the text, bliss. Right, their experience is bliss all the time. Mm -hmm. So they don't uh, don't suffer. Actually, Buddhas are not capable. The Buddhas have compassion for others and understand others' suffering, but themselves never suffer. Um, and then the text, but the text explains these other points that um. To make a point about bodhisattvas that make it what you're asking, I think, which is there are bodhisattvas who have generated, you know, the, the definition of a bodhisattva is somebody who's generated bodhicitta. But there are bodhisattvas um, who have not yet seen the ultimate nature of reality and bodhisattvas who have seen the ultimate nature of reality, right? They call Arya. The Arya bodhisattva is a bo noble bodhisattva. It means somebody who's seen em emptiness, the ultimate nature of reality, directly in meditative equipoise. And the differentiation they make, the, the text makes this differentiation that before the bodhisattva has seen the ultimate nature of reality directly, um, you know, their compassion gives them a way of coping with suffering, but they still suffer. Uh, they still suffer birth, aging, death, pain, you know, and so on. And then but the text explains, though, that those bodhisattvas who have seen the ultimate nature of reality directly um don't experience those things in the same way you know, so they it says they have a subtle kind of death but not they don't actually experience death the way we do and so on so they wouldn't they don't suffer in the same way they, they're not completely like a buddha but they don't they don't experience their body in the same way we do and so on so so you can sort of use that to think okay there are different kinds of body i guess my point is there are different kinds of bodhisattvas who have different kinds of experiences um, I don't think Catholicism at least it, um, says we all have Buddha nature or anything God like nature. That's the sense of Catholicism when you said we're sinners from birth. Right. But I mean, that's the, so there's human beings and then there's God. So there's not, a, there's not much of a crossover. <laughs> you can strive toward being a better person, but you are never God. Yeah. Where's so, and the idea we have a Buddha nature is totally different. Different idea. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, because yeah, clearly the Buddha nature idea, right, is that you yourself, there's nothing that the Buddha accomplished that you can't accomplish. That's clear. Right? So there's not one single thing. Like so in there's 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 absolutely nothing that the Buddha did that you can't do. And the Buddha was once exactly like you, is the idea. The story actually goes the Buddha was in hell. When he achieved, when he uh, first generated compassion, bodhicitta, he, uh, you know, so he was an ordinary person who took rebirth in hell, actually, and then developed compassion for the other beings in hell, and uh, and thought, I want to become enlightened to benefit them, and then that was the beginning of his practice, you know, towards becoming a Buddha. Uh, so the you know the Buddha was worse off than us that day <laughs> until he became better off than us when he generated compassion like that, but. Uh, so the idea is that you know Buddha was like us, and you're you can become anything that Buddha. Became. And um, so then the last uh, bit of this, yeah, uh, this section is immutable during the totally pure state. Right. So that was that was covering how the you know the it's kind of funny, right? You get the point here, which was earlier. Remember that we said the Vajra topics, and Vajra means difficult to penetrate something. Right? Because what it's getting at here, right, is that it's going through all these different stages, right? <laughs> I said there were three, right? The impure, the pure and impure, and then the pure. But then it's saying, well, even among the pure and impure, right, there are 10 levels, 10 boomies, and so on, right? So the body, you know, one can make all of these, one can go through all these different levels of progress as one moves towards Buddhahood. And then, um, and then it's saying, and during all those different stages of change, your Buddha nature is immutable. It's unchanging, right? And that's a difficult, and Maitreya earlier said, that's one of the difficult points to understand. And to understand that, you have to understand the harmony of the ultimate and the conventional levels of reality, which we'll get into more. But here he's saying, so it was immutable during all those, you know, the, the, your Buddha nature, your your Buddha nature, let's say, your Tathagata Garbha, your essence of the Tathagata, was immutable while it progressed, while one was in the pure, impure state, it was immutable while one is progressing through these different stages. 
and it's immutable in the totally pure state of Buddhahood itself. So he says, uh, the Dharmakaya, right, the truth body of the Tathagatas in the totally pure state is immutable because of being endowed with the qualities of inexhaustibility. It is the refuge of migrators because it is continuous and without end, is always without the two extremes of deprecation and superimposition and without conceptuality, and is in nature of in the nature of not being subject to destruction because it is not formed by karma. Um, so there are various points I want to make. One is the Dharmakaya, right, is the mind of the Buddha, right? The the you know, it's, it's the um, yeah. I always think that's interesting though, isn't it? Like there, you know, we, we have these terms kaya, right? Which means body in Sanskrit. So I just want to make a point. Like I was thinking about this yesterday, you know. They're getting it. There are different kind. Like it's an interesting point in Buddhism, right? I just think of it because often as we talk about our body, right, or like somatic issue, you know. And according to Buddhism, there are many kinds of bodies, right? They use the body. They use the term body differently, don't they? Because we wouldn't say, you know, your mental body, right, or something. That's really what they're saying. So there's the physical body and the dharmakaya, right, of the Buddha, and the Buddha has the sabogakaya. So there are all different kinds of bodies described. But so they're getting it. This is the, I just want to point that out. Dharmakaya means the truth body. Um, I, think, I think the right word would be facet. Than body. Yeah, what is interesting, they use the word, they, well, they use kaya, though, right? Like, uh, like emanation body. And then, you know, so yeah, I mean, of course, it's not physical body. Is that like that which carries? Kaya, that which carries. Uh, well, the body is that. I, I actually, I'll, I'll say one, one point, like uh, the way I think I'll share a reflection I have, which is, you know, there's a famous uh, section of the Vajra Cutter Sutra, uh, which was taught by the Buddha, right, where he says, um, he says, those who by my form knew me, knew me, didn't know me. The Buddha is the Dharma talk. And what he was getting at was that um, we identify people right by their body. You know, like when you see somebody's body, but he was getting at a point, right? When you see somebody's body, you think you see them, right? That's how we think. I say, like I say, oh, I saw Jan today, right? And that means I saw her form actually. And I think it's a, I think it's one way of getting at it is is the Buddha doing what the Buddha often did, I think, with his use of language, which is taking the way we ordinarily think of things and what's the word? Um, and uh, helping us understand something. That's the Buddha's point. Buddha was helping us understand, right? So there is a, you know, so if somebody saw the form body of a Buddha, they thought they saw the Buddha, right? And he's saying, that's not the Buddha. The Buddha is reality. The Buddha is the wisdom understanding reality. You know, and um, so I, I think that's part of why he calls it Dharma Kaya. Yeah, so I think like in my contemplation, what I thought of Dharma is like, there's two aspects to it. One is the observer, the view. So there has to be something of a body, right? So that's the body, it's the form body and other bodies. Uh, but then the person who's sewing that body from that viewpoint, it's a facet, it's a manifestation, right? Yep. So I think from that viewpoint, it's like, I'm sewing up as this, I'm sewing up as this. And it could be literally, they could sew up different forms at the same time, like they said, because Obviously, there's no duality for the person, right? So, so there are like two aspects to that. That's how I come to think that. Two viewpoints, right? Mm -hmm. So a facet would be for the, the person sewing up in different forms, and then body is from the USC point of view, saying, I'm observing the body, so there's something in this. That's mm -hmm. how I... Mm -hmm. in my, in my Mysterious point, yeah. Though, yeah. So I... All right, so I, I do kind of conceptually get... Yeah, if I'm looking at Buddha and I just see his body and not see the dim, the deep spiritual well dimensional whatever. But when I look at a statue, <laughs> I look at an eye or a symbol of like I'm looking at you know, favorites across me. Um and I know that's not Buddha, that it's symbolic to that non-physical form, and yet it's in a physical form. Okay. 
<laughs> and um, the commentaries on this section, I want to go into a little bit because it, it makes a point, which is um, the commentaries make a number of points, which are this, because uh, it says, uh, where it says, is in the nature of not being the subject to destruction because it is not formed by karma. It says that there. And the commentaries make a point, which is that uh, impure beings and our ordinary beings are uh, are subject to destruction because we're born by the force of karma and mental afflictions. And so it is that when we, you know we have karma, and when we it says in the twelve links of dependent origination, for example, when we die. Um, our mental afflictions, our, in particular, our grasping of the self, right? grasping of existence, uh, activates our karma, and we sort of um, take rebirth, depending dependent upon karma. Um, and then uh, the text has been explaining how partially pure and partially impure beings, uh, so these kind of bodhisattvas, aren't born that way. They're born through the force of compassion com uh, like so love compassion and aspirational prayers like so there's these bodhisattvas and then they have what they're called pure karma so in other words those beings their car they have they have karma but it's not you know that was serious is right um because they don't grasp at things as if they're truly existent when they do actions their karma is pure um, and so they take birth, they say, through compassionate prayers. So when they're dying, for example, they think, may I benefit beings? May I go here? May I go there? You know, um, may I go wherever beings need me most to benefit them? Or may I benefit beings in this way or that way? Um, you know, and so they have these kind of, what's it called, bodhicitta prayers. Uh, and they take rebirth through the power of those kinds of prayers. And through their pure karma, right? So they benefit. Right? So an example would be like there are many examples in Tibetan uh, Buddhist history, like where being you know bodhisattvas like benefited some person and then said something to them, and then they take rebirth later as their child and so on, and that through the prayer of you know sort of their connection to that person. Um, and here this is saying, uh, let's say it this way, because. Even that pure, I'll say it this way. Um, because of that pure karma, right, they can take rebirth through love and compassion. Uh, and so they don't experience life in the same way because they have a different kind of cause for their life. Uh, their life takes, takes effect for a different reason due to a different force. But it's still impermanent. Right? It's still arisen through the power of a particular prayer of a particular aspiration, of a particular pure karma. Which is karma. Which is still karma. It's pure karma, but it's still karma. And then it's saying the Buddhas don't have that. The Buddhas don't, uh, don't take rebirth through the power of even pure karma. And so therefore, the Buddha is not subject to the same um, what's the word? <laughs> forces, yeah, uh, effects. And so it says, and I'll read the quote, it says, the Buddha is uh, free from impure karma and also free from pure karma, and therefore is beyond birth and death. And um, and I, I guess, um, and there are various points in this text where it's, it's say, uh, the Buddha isn't born, the Buddha doesn't die. For me, I felt actually yesterday as I was preparing for today's class, I felt quite moved, thinking, "Wow, it's funny that it fell on the uh, one-year anniversary of or on the section uh, one-year anniversary of the passing of Lama Zopa Rinpoche, and we're up to a section that's pointing out that Buddhas don't aren't born, the Buddhas don't die." Um, so interesting, uh, and that's what it says next: there is no birth and no death; there is no harm and no aging. Therefore, the Dharmakaya of the Tathagata is permanent, constant, at peace, and unalterable. Uh, and there's another section of the text that says, it, it, describing this, right? It says, um, according to the merit of beings, 
they have an appearance of certain things. But from the Buddha's own side, there's no experience of, of the aging. There's no experience of birth. There's no experience of death. Um, and what this is getting at, right, is, um, and again, it goes through the commentary here, where it says, it says, it says there's no birth, no death, no harm, and no aging. And um, and the earlier it said, uh, permanent, uh, permanent, constant, at peace, and unalterable. So that's, that's related. The earlier it had those terms. Um, so I'll make a few points. One is, um, it's permanent because it's unconditioned, right? Um, you know, and even Arya Bodhisattvas have a kind of mental body, they say, that's conditioned, a conditioned phenomena. But the Dharmakaya is unconditioned, which means it's an emptiness, right? That which is unconditioned means emptiness, right? Um, which means it doesn't arise due to causes and conditions. That's what, I mean, unconditioned means not arisen due to causes and conditions. So it's getting at um, it's getting at a few points here. One is really you'd have to say the nature body of a Buddha, right? Is the uh, emptiness of the Buddha's mind that is unconditioned because it's an emptiness. It's an ultimate truth. Um, but then, um, even the Buddha's um, what's we say right? Well, I'll, I'll follow the text because I don't want to sort of get it. There, it says more later, and I'm sort of getting ahead of myself. So I don't want to do that. So it says here, the Dharmakaya of the Tagadas is not born with a mental body. That's what I was starting to get ahead of. So um, because it is permanent, it does not die and transmigrate with inconceivable transformation because it is constant. And so um, when Ken Rinpoche was explaining this verse, he said, there's this term here, mental body. And he said, there are three types of mental bodies that sentient being, that beings um, sometimes manifest. And again, mental body is a funny term, isn't it? I'm just putting that out. But our subtle body is another way of putting it. And Ken Shermshi said, uh, of those three, he didn't, he didn't put it this way, but the lowest of those three is the bardo. When somebody, any ordinary person dies, they, for a period of time, have a kind of mental body that goes um, around until they take rebirth. And that mental body of the bardo being is made by the subtle energy and the mind of that being. Uh, and that's completely controlled by karma, or mental afflictions if you're an ordinary person. <laughs> and he said, so a Buddha is free of that. Um, then uh, arhats, he said, the arhats who, are, who achieve individual liberation have a kind of subtle mental body that they abide in, in a pure land uh, when they've achieved arhatship and they're sort of um, dualistically escaping from samsara. And uh, he makes the point that, uh, so and Kinshri point out, the Buddha is free from that kind of body. They don't have that kind of dualistic body of sort of, I'm now out of samsara and I want to be away from the suffering, right? Um, and they said, and then these Arya Bodhisattvas have a subtle mental body after they achieve the direct realization of emptiness um, that uh, is formed by their pure karma. And that's and then they send out these sort of emanations to benefit people, uh, sentient beings. And he says, Buddhas are also free from that because it's dualistic. So the Buddhas are free from all those kinds of mental bodies. Um, because they're all born of a dualistic perception. Um, and the Buddhas are completely beyond dualistic experiences. Um, yeah. So it almost appears uh, the subtle bodies are relative right, in, in their capacities uh, mm -hmm. um, in terms of how much they can benefit, how many they can benefit, and so on and so forth, uh, depending on karma, because again, it's the weakest of the karma yep. and the subtle Yeah, they're connected to karma. That's right. Whereas the Buddha, it's interesting. And so it's the point earlier, right? The Buddha is totally free of karma and totally free of a mental body. Yeah. So then how do you characterize it? If a Buddha who has made prayers to manifest in a certain circumstance, manifest in that circumstance, how do you characterize that? 
later in the text, there are these various metaphors that are given. It's actually in a different chapter, which we won't really cover in detail, but um, there are all these, it's actually, you know, um, that commentary, I mean, the later chapter, I think it's, it's chapter, it's the chapter on Buddha's activities, yeah. Uh, it makes these various, it uses these points. It says, uh, it's trying to help us understand the question you're raising. So it says, it makes the point, remember that the Buddha is free from conceptuality, right? It says that point, that's one of the, it's emphasized in this text, the Buddhas don't have conceptuality. And then it raises the question you're raising. It says, so how do the Buddhas benefit sentient beings? And then it uses all these, it uses various metaphors. It says, um, it says things like the crop, you know, uh, crops grow in dependence upon the earth everywhere, but the earth has no conceptuality. Then it says the rain falls beings, you know, on, on the earth, but the clouds have no conceptuality. And then it makes it uses this other metaphor. <laughs> Sometimes I think, uh, well, the metaphor it uses is um, Indra, which is a Hindu, like, uh, yeah. as you well know, Hindu deity. And there's a story, there's a traditional Indian image, I guess, which is there's a that there's the ground of pure or pure jewel. And although Indra is in the paradises of the thirty three gods and uh, high up in the whatever Mount Meru or something that his form manifests in this pure barrel and when beings see it they think I want to they see the heaven of the 33 reflected in this pure barrel and they think I want to take rebirth there that looks really awesome and so they do virtue uh, and the text uses this metaphor it says Indra is not actually there in the barrel you know he's not but it benefits beings because they think, oh, that heaven looks quite delightful. I want to take rebirth there, and they do uh, good things. They create good karma. So it just is. Uh, and he says, and well, the text says that pure barrel is a metaphor for the mind. It says, if your mind, if you pure to the extent that you can, that you create the karma, the pure, pure enough mind, you'll see the form of a Buddha, and you'll do virtuous activities. And it says the Buddha doesn't exist outside your, you can't say the Buddha exists outside your mind. You can't say the Buddha exists in your mind only. And yet the Buddha manifests to your mind and you do good things, um, you know, in through that relationship. So that's the metaphor of inconceivable. And, and the point is, is that they're getting at is one point is that the image in the, in the, it'd be like if you watched a live stream of the Dalai Lama on your computer, right? There's no conceptuality there in the computer, and yet, if you follow that advice, you practice, and it'll be quite something remarkable. Uh, that's the metaphor they're using to try to express this idea. You know, so that, that's the answer from the text perspective. Uh, you know, it's beyond my conceptuality, of course, but um, but for me, it's been, again, I'll just share it. It's, been, it's an interesting timing to be, for me personally, reading that text that on this day, reflecting on, you know, so, you know, that uh, Buddha, Buddha or your teacher doesn't go anywhere if they're a Buddha. Right? Um, anyway. They're not doing anything. <laughs> and they manifest to you if you're. Yeah. If you can see. Yeah. <laughs> and then it says it is not harmed uh, by the sicknesses of the subtle imprints because it is pacified it does not age by unaltered non-afflicted karma because it is eternal um, I'll read one more verse here and then it says the uncompounded basic element is to be known as permanent and so forth through two lines and likewise two lines <laughs> and two lines and the two lines in their respective order. Uh, what's that all getting at? <laughs> it's a little confusing. I mean, um, it's getting at it, it, it's getting at these uh, four terms: uh, permanent, constants, permanence, constancy, peace, and unalterability. 
uh, in reference to the uh, Buddha. So permanent means um, that uh, the Buddha is, um, and these come from a sutra, by the way. So permanent means the Buddha is not born. Um, and that the Buddha is immutable and has uh, unending qualities. Constancy means uh, the Buddha won't die, and is a constant, and there uh, is beyond death. Uh, doesn't um, doesn't even have that subtle kind of mental body, and therefore is beyond death, uh, and is always available as a refuge to beings, uh, for beings to take refuge and uh, in. Uh, peace refers to no sickness. Uh, right, and these are the four things, right? Birth, aging, sickness, and death are often referred to in Buddhism for ordinary beings, but they're saying a Buddha doesn't have birth, aging, sickness, and death. So, uh, so peace means constantly non dual and in, in a non conceptual experience. So, and that because they're non conceptual, they're beyond dualistic experiences and beyond um, karma. And then inalterability means no aging, uh, so not subject to destruction because they're unconditioned. Right. And part of what this is getting at, of course, is um, that what's being emphasized here is the Buddha's um, emptiness and the Buddha's mind directly perceiving emptiness. Right. So when we think of the Buddha, this is, I mean, if you if you feel uncomfortable when you're reading these things, right? Like there is, like if you're thinking, uh, that's why I mentioned that quote from the Vajra Cutter Sutra, it says, "Those who by my form didn't see me, didn't see me. I'm the Dharma, I'm the Dharma or the Dharma Kaya." Right. It's getting at an emphasis on the Dharmakaya, right? That the nature of the Buddha is the Dharmakaya. Um, and that's connected to your own Buddha nature. Um, so it says, because the Dharmakaya is endowed with limitless qualities, it has the meaning of being immutably permanent. That's what it, these are the four terms. Because it is equal to the limits of samsara, it has the meaning of being constant, uh, a constant entity of refuge. Uh, because it is in the nature of non-conceptuality and as the meaning of, of pacified reality, free from duality of the two extremes, because it is endowed with the qualities of not being produced by the two kinds of karma, pure or impure, it is not subject to destruction, meaning uh, this is the meaning of being eternal. Um, and a, another point there where it says not grasping at extremes, so it's not grasping at the extremes of... Um, permanence or annihilation, right? So it's, it doesn't grasp at things as if they're, on the one hand, permanent or even um, independently existent, but it also understands that things aren't uh, non-existent. It's not nihilistic, right? And again, th that's the hard, you know, Gyaltsev Jain, his text points out, that's the hardest point of Buddhist philosophy, understanding the, the harmony of that, um, because that, that, that well, one way to put it, the harmony of the conventional truth and the ultimate truth, or that um, dependent arising implies emptiness, or is a synonym for emptiness, and emptiness is a synonym for dependent arising. Uh, because as soon as you say dependent arising, things seem to have their own intrinsic quality, but they don't have intrinsic qualities. If they did, they couldn't be dependent. Right, that which is dependent, it's quite difficult, but it's, I, I, actually it makes sense if you let's sort of say it right like this. I've said this example before, right? Like, as soon as you say, this is the cause of that, right? it seems like this is a cause and that's a result, right? But the cause isn't a cause in the absence of the result. Right? It's only a cause relative to that result. And a result is only a result relative to that cause, right? And um, the result what we're calling the result seems like a result, right? But in the in a different context, that result can serve as a cause of something else, right? And what we said, oh, that's the cause. It felt like a cause, right? It's actually a result of something else, right? So it's not a cause or a result from its own side. But it, it's correct to label it a cause or a result, independence upon uh, context, isn't it? So things lack independent existence or lack an independent nature. Um, but they're not non-existent as that, right? You can't, if you say, oh, therefore it's not a cause at all, that wouldn't be true, would it? It is a cause, but only relative to the result and only through a process of labeling it. 
relative to one thing, right? And so everything exists that way. You exist that way, right? And you exist, but you don't exist seriously, right? Intrinsically. And any role you play it doesn't exist intrinsically. It only exists. One way to say it is relatively to something else. But another way is to say, and that's easier in some way. What's harder actually is to say, so therefore, by labeling. And you exist in a particular, you know, any version of yourself that you grasp at uh, doesn't exist intrinsically. That's a simple way to put it. Um, so anyway, that, that ends that ninth point, right? That the... Um, That those uh sorry, the, the level of the you know at those different points along the path right you get the sense here right that, that one is progressing and yet well, another way of putting it is one you know it's kind of funny right one is progressing through these different levels of the path right and that's accurate conventionally just like it's accurate to say the cause is a cause relative to a result but the cause lacking independent sorry, an independent essence as a cause right so what i was getting at a minute ago same point applies as you go through different levels of the path conventionally you can talk about oh this person's on the first boon or this person's a buddha or this person's an ordinary being but actually there being an ordinary being only exists relatively ever right it, it only existed relatively ever it never existed in some other way it never existed intrinsically. If there being an ordinary being existed intrinsically, then they could never become enlightened, right? Because if they were intrinsically an ordinary being, then they would always be an ordinary being, right? So beings, you can say, that if you, like if I feel, let's say, if, if a person is filled with craving or anger or something, they're ordinary, right? But they're ordinary relative to you know. So you say, oh, because they gave rise to they give rise to these kinds of afflictive emotions. You can label them and say, you know, compared to a Buddha, they're ordinary, right? But it's compared to a Buddha, so it exists relatively. But they're not intrinsically ordinary. If they were, they wouldn't have Buddha nature. And everyone has Buddha nature, right? And that lack of that lack of a independent essence is your Buddha nature. And because you lack an independent nature as an ordinary being, your nature is such that you can become an enlightened being. Um, and a Buddha's lack, and, a, and, a, and the Buddha himself lacks an intrinsic nature as an enlightened being. If they had it, they would have always been enlightened. And then they went to, you know, but they they weren't. They became enlightened, right? So um, Buddha nature is intrinsic. Yeah. But it, actually, what's interesting is Buddha nature is intrinsic to all beings, but it's not intrinsically existent. That's an important distinction that Lama Sokapu makes very carefully. He makes those kind of distinctions very carefully in his teachings on MDS. He says, the ultimate truth, he makes this point in the Lamrim Chenmo, actually, where he says, the ultimate truth is the ultimate nature of things, but it's not ultimately existent. He said, if it were ultimately existent, it, then um, it wouldn't be discoverable. Actually. Right? Uh, so he says the ultimate truth is is what you find when you examine things on the ultimate level, but it's not ultimately existent. It's conventionally existent also. So he makes that distinction. Just when so you find intrinsic, intrinsic, intrinsic. Intrinsic. Can you define it? Oh, intrinsic. Yeah, existing independently. Okay. Yeah. I just, I make sure I'm on the same page. Yeah. No. Good question. Yeah. So intrinsic means existing independently, and and what Buddhism is really saying is things. Things exist interdependent, not independent. That's why. So I'd say that's why we say that things don't exist intrinsically. What it's saying is they exist relatively or interdependently or inter through interdependence, not intrinsically, meaning not independent. Including Buddha nature? Including Buddha nature. Yeah. So Buddha nature is not intrinsic. It's not well, so you'd say it's oh, sorry, sorry, it's not it's not intrinsically existent. That's right. My Buddha nature is not intrinsic. 
What do you mean by existent? I thought oh, that the case that we've been used to. <laughs> Here we go. What was the question? I'm oh, sorry, let's go to the question. Oh, there were two different questions. Um, existent. I'm not sure what you mean by that. That's what's kind of confusing me. It seems like it must have a different meaning than what it used to intend. Which thing, though? Which is? When you say it's not intrinsically, good in nature is intrinsic, but it's not intrinsically existent. Oh, I see. I should, but more, I should say it differently. What this is getting at really, I mean, we're measuring this up here it's in text. Isn't it both intrinsic and not intrinsic? <laughs> like, can it be both? Go um, to nature, you mean? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes, yeah. Why not? There, I think it, to be accurate, I mean, I'm trying to make like sure it's capacity for nirvana or whatever, right? I'll say is this is that Buddha nature is is not is not one there, I think uh, the commentaries make two points. One is Buddha nature is not intrinsically existent. That's clear. It's very clear in the commentaries and in the Buddhist tradition. And at the same time, the way they actually say it is um all beings have Buddha nature at all times. That's probably a more accurate way to say it. So like there is it's never so maybe I wish I wish I shouldn't use the word intrinsic though if if in other words a better way to say it is all beings always have Buddha nature or Tathagata Garbha is is the final nature of beings you know and that any being who has a mind has Buddha nature that's their accurate way to say it uh, but it's not intrinsically existent in the sense that it doesn't exist independently and the simple way to put that is. Put it this way, Buddha nature is the is actually what it actually is is the final nature of your mind. Right? So wherever there's mind, by definition, there's Buddha nature because it's the ultimate nature of mind. But to say it exists, uh, what's the word? It doesn't exist independently because it depends upon mind. Actually, right? It's the nature of mind. Right? So it doesn't exist independent of the mind. You don't. That's why you can't say like a rock has that nature. nature. Exists based on causes and conditions. The nature exists based on causes and conditions. No. So therefore, it's intrinsic. Buddha nature doesn't exist on causes and conditions. It does. Yeah, it doesn't exist based on causes. Uh, no, but it, I guess in, if intrinsic means you, would, if we say intrinsic means independent, there's there are different. Oh, actually, no, I'll clarify it this way. There are three kinds of dependence described in Buddhist philosophy. One is dependent upon causes and conditions. Buddha nature is not. Another is dependent upon parts, right? Things can be dependent upon their parts. Buddha nature is not that. The last one is dependent upon a label. Dependent on? Label, on labeling. Merely labeled, let say. Buddha nature is dependent upon it. So it's not, so it's not independent. <laughs> Because it's dependent in the third way, which is not, which unconditioned things are, and that's why actually in Buddhism, in Buddhist philosophy, see, all unconditioned things are still empty because they're still dependent, but they're not dependent upon causes and conditions if they're unconditioned. So space is also, like space is an example of an unconditioned thing. Space is unconditioned, so it's not dependent upon causes and conditions, but it is dependent arising. And the same with my, and the ultimate nature of mind. Not dependent upon causes and conditions, but it is dependent on arising. Actually, we're going to pause there because we're going to do a meditation. And we're, because we're at the time. We're supposed to, and, uh, what we need to do, though, is take a... Oh, um, actually, can, John, can we come back to it next time? Because otherwise we're going to, um, we won't have time to do the meditation. Um, so I'll take questions. Save the question and bring it up next time. But if somebody, if people can help, what we're going to do is we're going to do the Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga, but we're going to do it based upon the um, yep. Uttara Tantra. And um, the I looked, and it's in volume two of FPMT Prayers. Oh, we're going to get the other one. And uh, so we'll take a short five minute break. And if you want to, if people online want to stay, you're welcome to stay. If you don't want to stay, you're obviously going to have to. But we're going to. And it's not going to be just reading the prayer. We're going to actually try to meditate a bit. Um,
and it's in honor of Lama's Ephraim Shade. So I'm going to stop the recording for now, and I'm going to make it a separate recording. I will record that also, but I'm going to record it separately. Oh, pause. Stop recording.